Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group and as solo artists, past, present, and things to come when we get a line on what those are. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and a the former Beatles desk at the New York Times, and now a freelancer. And I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and just this week is celebrating the 37th anniversary of his first Beatles show at WNYT Radio that became basically the basis of every little thing. So congratulations, Ken, and hello. Thank you, Alan. It's hard for me to believe. (laughs) As we're speaking right now, it seems like, I don't know, 20 years ago maybe, but not, not 37. But thank you, Alan, and hi, everyone. And a relative youngster compared <laughs> with Ken. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. <laughs> Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUVFM 90.7 in the New York area since 1984, which is a mere 35 years. I'm a baby. Mm. 35, yeah. <laughs> 35 so, years. Yeah, just, so, my, what was it? Three weeks ago, I think, three, four weeks ago was my 35th of my first ever radio show and it was also on fuv so 35 years there Uh uh-huh but hello everyone it's uh, great to have everyone on board for another chat and try as you might you will never catch up with ken (laughs) (laughs) even if i do twice as many shows what is the way that works (laughs) well maybe you know if you put all if you if you put all of our years of experience together we'd be older than methuselah Mm. Yeah, <laughs> hey, that that make a good line for a song. Mm. <laughs> okay. Um, I I met you uh, actually, Ken. The very first time was uh, in 1984, I think, and I believe it was the early wee morning hours of December 24th, if I remember correctly, that uh, me and a uh, a friend visited you. In the days when you were at WXPS, which is... Oh, that's that's what it is now. It used to be WZFM. That's right, yes. And, and now, um, actually, uh, no, it's not... Uh, is it, It's the peak now, 107.1 right. in White Plains. And the call letters, I actually forget, but it's not XPS. What was it at that time when you were there? WZFM. That's right. That's right. Wow. That's a long time ago. So we welcome you all to our ongoing oral history of New York radio. (laughs) And we're going to take a break at some point and talk about two other anniversaries that uh, we're celebrating this month, which is uh, the 50th anniversary of Paul's marriage to Linda, which was, I believe, March 12th, 1969. And John's, the 50th anniversary of John's marriage to Yoko, which was a few days later on March 20th. But first, we have some news. And Ken, over to you. Boy, have we got news. <laughs> I, want to get a few tele- I want to get a teletype sound effect to put oh. in here. <laughs> you know, like make right. it sound like the old 1010 wins while you're uh, doing the news. That might sound good. That's actually not bad, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the first news item, which just broke today, we're recording this on March the 18th. Danny Harrison made an announcement that he has been chosen to be the opening act for Jeff Lynne's ELO tour this summer for all of his North American dates. And uh, I'm ecstatic about that. You know, (laughs) I just wish that I had bought tickets to see uh, this show. But now I'm going to try to be uh, hunting them down. I did see Jeff Lynne the last few years, as you have, uh, Darren. Yeah, two years. Yeah, right. I've seen him twice, not last year, the year before that in a special New York City uh, kind of, uh, I don't know what, I don't even remember if it was the album wasn't out yet, but it was kind of an, an announcement show when the tour was announced uh, as Jeff Lynn's ELO when he played Irving Plaza, which I guess that would have been 2016 or 2015. Anyway, uh, yeah, I've seen him twice. <laughs> Yeah, I saw him at Radio City Music Hall a couple of years ago in Madison Square Garden last year. So, tremendous show, by the way. 
Anyway, we're going to be talking about the new John and Yoko documentary, Above Us Only Sky, at the end of our news items here. Uh, Paul McCartney gets ready to kick off his South American tour with five dates running from March 20th, that's this Wednesday, in Santiago, Chile. He's got the one date in Chile, or Chile, then one in Argentina, and three dates in Brazil. And Paul just added a second date in Las Vegas at the T-Mobile Arena. He already has a show booked there for June the 29th. The new, sh- the new show will be June 28th. And uh, pre-sale tickets went on sale last week. They went on sale today on Monday the 18th um, at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Ringo starts his all-star band tour um, actually this Thursday at Harrow's Resort in Southern California. The big news about Ringo, apart from the tour, is that it was announced that he has been working on a brand new album. And in fact, online, he posted photos of himself with Steve Lukather and his co-producer, Bruce Sugar. And he has been working on a new album for a few months now, but there's no news when that will come out. But, you know, I got to hand it to him. He's always busy. He never stops recording. He never stops touring. Got to hand it to him. He's got, I don't know. All that energy, <laughs> how he how he has it, but uh, it's it's amazing. Anyway, because he drinks um, goat milk. <laughs> does he? <laughs> the molecules are smaller. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just quoting. <laughs> oh, I didn't even know that. I didn't know if you were joking or not. No, no, that's what he says. So it's goat milk. That's a secret. Let me write that down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Next week's show will be on my reaction to drinking goat milk. <laughs> Let's hope that's not the case. Yes, there'll but, be a quiz. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he did say a while ago that he eats a lot of kale, so mm, I'm sure yeah. that helps. Well then. Also, more news here. Uh, Video Music is reporting that a new documentary called An Accidental Studio is being made, which tells the story of George Harrison's groundbreaking film studio handmade films this will be the first original documentary from amc uk and it will air on their channel may the 4th and on amc channels internationally later in the year it uh, includes never before seen interviews with key players and uh, it also sets to capture an extraordinary moment in film history through the eyes of the filmmakers and actors involved including archival interviews with george harrison himself Handmade Films created some of Britain's most iconic films, and they released maverick films that every other film company rejected, like The Long Good Friday, Time Bandits, and With Nail and I. And as most fans know, it all started when George helped to finance and produce Monty Python's Life of Brian. Mm -hmm. This after uh, the British company, EMI, I think, had backed out of taking the film. And coincidentally... This is some segue here. It just so happens <laughs> that we're approaching the uh, 40th anniversary of Life of Brian. Mm-hmm. And it's actually going to be shown in select theaters around the country because of that. And George makes a cameo in that. Yes, he does. So keep your eyes peeled now that it's on the big screen, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. That, that was, was a great so company. Long. That was really a great company. You know, it was, in a way, it was like Apple Records. You know, it just just produced some really, really good stuff. Um, I haven't seen every handmade film, but I think I've seen all but two or three. And, um, you know, great stuff, great casts, well-written stuff, good soundtracks in a lot of cases. I mean, With Nell and I has uh, was one of the few films in those days that could get its hands on a Beatles track. I mean, I wonder why, but still, I think it was while my guitar gently weeps. And I, I watch those films every now and then. I mean, with Nell and I is definitely a favorite. And, uh, and there are a number of others that I return to now and then. I mean, obviously life of Brian, but, uh, you know, plenty of others. I remember seeing time bandits in the movie theater. Mm-hmm. And, you know, haven't seen it since, but I enjoyed it when I first watched it. Mm-hmm. You know, but part of the reason why I wanted to see it was because it had Dream Away in there at right. the end of the movie. Right. So, uh, but that was a real fun film. But uh, we look forward to uh, hearing more news about this, and hopefully it'll air in the U.S. sometime this year. Mm-hmm. We shall see. And more news, speaking of Danny Harrison. 
There is a new HBO documentary miniseries called The Case Against Adnan Syed that's uh, running on HBO, and the music score comes from Danny and Paul Hicks, the two guys from the new number two. So they are continuing working on film scores, and they've worked on a few others before, like Beautiful Creatures. So if you get a chance to see this documentary, know that Danny was involved with the music. Some encouraging words from Julian Lennon, who met with music mixer extraordinaire Michael Brower. Julian says that Michael has mixed some of his favorite albums and tracks, and it looks like they'll be working together on some new music that Julian will bring to the table later this year. Julian's last album, Everything Changes, was released a while back now, 2011. Doesn't seem like that long ago, but it was. Would love to hear some more new music coming from Julian. Also, last week we lost a giant in the music field, that being session drummer Hal Blaine. Hal played on countless hits, especially in the 60s and 70s. And uh, everyone on this planet has heard his drumming. It would be impossible not to hear it. All you'd need is a radio. <laughs> As a drummer from the Wrecking Crew, he played on, these are just a few of the classics, The Ronettes Be My Baby, Simon and Garfunkel's Mrs. Robinson and Bridge Over Troubled Water, The Birds Mr. Tambourine Man, The Mamas and Papas Monday Monday, so many of the Monkees records, A Taste of Honey from Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass, The Fifth Dimensions, The Chorus Let the Sunshine In and Wedding Bell Blues, The Carpenters Close to You, and The Beach Boys' Good Vibrations. It's been reported that he played on 40 songs that hit number one in the country and over 35,000 recorded tracks. Right. And um, as far as the Beatles are concerned, I know that um, he played on John's rock and roll album. He wasn't the only drummer on that album because uh, I know Jim Keltner was also on that album as well. He drummed on Jackie Lomax's album called Is This What You Want, which George Harrison produced and played on. Um, he actually said, and I saw a, a video of him talking about this, that for Ringo, he played on what he called Ringo's vocal album, which I take to mean his Sentimental Journey album, since Ringo didn't uh, drum on that album, he just sang. And he also said that while he wasn't in the studio with Paul McCartney, his drumming was overdubbed on some of Paul's work. I don't know what exactly that would be, but uh, he said that on video in an interview. And without a doubt, a tremendous talent and a huge influence on drummers everywhere, Hal Blaine, who just recently turned 90. Any comments on Hal, guys? Arguably one of the um, best known, most respected, maybe is a better, uh, better, better word, most respected drummers in music. It would be hard to, to talk about drummers and drumming without Hal Blaine's name coming up very early in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I mean, just just talk about his work with the Beach Boys alone, and you've got a legend. Hmm. Um, you know, and then pile on everything else that you mentioned. It, it's it's almost, and I don't, and I'm not joking when I say this, but it's almost like he's played on more than half of the music ever made. Um, <laughs> uh, seriously. Um, yeah, and, it, it would be much easier to like list the, much easier to list the stuff that he wasn't on than the he stuff that he was on, right? <laughs> Well, he's not yeah. on Paul McCartney's first solo album. We know that. Right. <laughs> uh, no, got a few more. Uh, but yeah, he is. Uh, the musicians like him are once in a lifetime. So uh, uh, rest in peace, Hal Blaine. I mean, I don't know what else to say that hasn't already been said. Yeah, along with Joe Osborne, who passed away just recently, tremendous bass player from the Wrecking Crew. Two legends right there. Yeah. That uh, we just lost. His music, Hal Blaine's drumming, is so embedded in our brains. <laughs> it would be impossible, especially if you're a drummer, to not be somewhat influenced by him. Because mm -hmm. he's just always been there, whether you realize it or not. So, all right. And uh, also, we, uh, we said we we're going to talk about the new John and Yoko documentary called Above Us Only Sky, which premiered on the A&E channel uh, last week on March the 11th. And so let's get our take on what you both thought of the documentary. We'll start with you, Darren. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, but I will just kind of preempt my opinions first with it's going to be so much nicer seeing the documentary without commercial breaks every 
two minutes. Because uh, <laughs> it really, the commercial breaks on the broad television broadcast really broke the flow of the show. Absolutely. Uh, it, was all, it was almost like you had to wait, where did we leave off now? Where were we? Yeah. Um, hard, to, hard to follow a, along with the narrative. It's uh, going to be on Netflix, but, right? It's going to be picked up by Netflix, which we'll, I, we'll yeah. do without commercials. Mid, I heard in it in May. Mid-May. In May? Yeah, mid-May. Yeah, mid yeah. May. I would love a, a disc of it, so hopefully Eagle Rock does release it on uh, DVD and Blu-ray. Uh, but anyway, I was amazed immediately with the quantity of stuff that I'd never seen before, video footage and the quality of it. You figure that we had, and we were just talking about this several months ago with the re-release of the Imagine album. You have the uh, Imagine film that John and Yoko made, and then the uh, the movie Imagine John Lennon. You had the making of the Imagine album, Give Me Some Truth. All of these projects kind of uh, basing their content on what you would assume was a very limited amount of film. Uh, footage that would be available and that's not the case because there was still a boatload of things that hadn't been seen and a lot of it turns up in this this new documentary uh, above us only sky anything in particular that really struck you that you hadn't seen before that really stood out i i I just completely get excited in general with the studio stuff because you're actually watching in the case of of uh these sessions that are in and the new documentary, some of these, some of these sessions we've seen in the past, but there's a lot more, and the quality is so much better. But the out, you know, having listened to the Imagine album forever, to actually watch it being recorded, you know, watch the musicians, Nicky Hopkins, Alan White, you know, uh, doing their parts, hearing uh, Klaus Gorman elaborate on, you know, why he played a certain riff on the bass the way he did. That's the stuff that really that uh, appeals to me, uh, and there's a lot of that in in Above Us Only Sky. And I even wonder if there's more maybe that didn't make the A and E broadcast because they had to make room for the commercials uh, that may be on you know the Netflix when it comes to Netflix and hopefully again on a physical format. Okay, Alan, how about you? Well, if you recall, um, I commented on this at length when we talked about the imaginary issues because I had got a copy of it when it was on in Britain. Right. Um, and uh, so I didn't watch it with the commercials every two minutes or there, you know, wouldn't have been a po- any point, but uh, I remember it as being, I, I remember being absolutely knocked out ab- uh, by it when I saw it. Um, and to remind you, I think it was done by the same people who did that Lennon NYC documentary mm-hmm. about his New York years, which mm-hmm. was also spectacular. And I kind of think that these guys ought to, you know, just make the missing installments uh, and then just put out a, a whole package of of everything because they obviously know how to make a documentary. They obviously know how to use the film that's available to them. And the, the one thing that I felt, um, you know, filled in another missing part in the Imagine materials that were released uh, earlier in the year, uh, or I guess it was last year, was that this had interviews with the people as they are today, looking back on their experience of working on Imagine, you know, in addition to the footage from the time. And uh, that was something that the ones that that Yoko had put out, uh, you know, Give Me Some Truth and the Imagine movie didn't have. I mean, those were those were made just from the footage of the time. And so now you sort of get to see these people and, you know, how they, how they look and sound today. Uh, and uh, I, I kind of thought that was interesting. Um, mm-hmm. But you also, as Darren said, you know, there was a lot of footage that didn't get into any of those previous ones. Uh, and uh, it, it just was, I think, a great contribution to the sort of ongoing Lenin biography project, if you, if you look at it that way. Yeah. I did just think of one thing, and again, this could have been the result of having seen it for the first time with the uh, commercials, was that I did think that they were going to get a little deeper into leaving England for New York. It was covered in the documentary, but it really wasn't 
it just seemed like the, the, they all of a sudden, next thing you know, they're in New York, John and Yoko, and there wasn't any any focus on at what point did they decide, you know what, we like it here, we want to stay here, and and mention that uh, Titten, Tittenhurst Park uh, ended up then uh, being uh, bought by Ringo. You know, even if it was a, just a, a passing uh, reference, these are very picky Yoon points I'm bringing out, but they were things that I would have uh, expected to get um, touched on that didn't. Okay. Well, I certainly loved it, and I want to watch it more often. I've only seen it once so far. But uh, by the way, I should point out that um, I just did an interview with Michael Epstein, who is a director of this documentary, and he is the same director who worked on Lennon NYC. But that interview is on my website, and I got to air some of it and post the whole interview on my website before the documentary aired. So he gave some insight as to what's in the film that uh, I think many of us will will revel in. And from my standpoint, being a big fan of the song How, as well as every song on, on the album, to open this documentary with John and George working on the song was amazing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Even though Even though George didn't end up being on the final mix of How, we did find out in the the book that came out on Imagine, Imagine John Yoko, that How was one of George's favorite songs mm-hmm. from John. And uh, not having played on it, you wouldn't have known that. But just to know, just to see the two of them work on the song together for John to show how the song goes, that alone was worth it for me. Mm-hmm. But for me, the interviews really helped to make this documentary special. It's really nice to see people like Klaus Foreman or um, Jim Keltner or Alan White now reflecting on, on the album and what they remember about it. But what makes it even more special are the people that you've heard of before, but you've never seen or been interviewed, like Dan Richter, who was Lennon's personal assistant. Or Eddie Veal, who was the engineer who built the studio mm-hmm. at Tittenhurst Park. Who, in fact, it's it. I don't know if it was mentioned at all. Maybe it was in the John and Yoko book. But for its time, for an artist to have his own studio built in his own home, that was really new. Mm-hmm. And so, John's studio and the one that George had built at Henley, and I think Eddie Veal was involved with that too. It's pretty much close in time there. You know, in 1970, 71. So, um, you know, to have him being interviewed was interesting. Diana Robertson, the secretary for John and Yoko, whose first assignment was to write a letter of John returning his MBE. (laughs) (laughs) You know, that was the first thing she was told to do. But uh, something like that. And all the interview clips with Julian, who came across wonderfully. um, He did. He did. Very good point. And all these people who are trying to point out that John really wanted uh, a new life with Yoko and was tired of being a Beatle, you know, and bringing out that point. It also is, you know, very supportive of Yoko and her importance in John's life, which ties in with our main topic here on the show. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it was very well done. Another real highlight for me was seeing um, footage from the film Clock, where you saw John... He was on acoustic guitar playing New York City. But for those of us who have heard some of the audio from Clock, which at one time was aired on the Lost Lennon tapes, and it's been bootlegged too. He, John did a lot of Buddy Holly music at that time, but I wish there would have been more of that in this film. <laughs> Release the whole film <laughs> by <laughs> itself. I'd be quite happy with that. But there are a lot of things here that I really enjoyed. And it just seemed like there are a lot of things that I saw before, but just a little bit more of it. Like John in, I guess it was a taxi on the way to the uh, the signing for Grapefruit, mm-hmm. where he's putting his Grapefruit shirt on. It just seemed like that was a little bit longer than what I'd seen before. And the footage of him and Yoko in the bookstore for the signing of Grapefruit seemed a little bit longer. Things like that. I want to ask the two of you, do you enjoy watching the footage in the studio when it's got that split screen effect? Because they use that during Give Me Some Truth. I don't know if it's effective. When you're watching two different things going on simultaneously, maybe you enjoy that, or does it distract you? I'm okay with it. I like it. I like it because if it's especially if it's a studio session and there's a lot going on, 
you know, I can watch, you know, if I have the opportunity to watch it more than once, mm. uh, you get the drummer, you can watch the bass player the next time. Or, uh, you know, your eyes go back and forth. There's so much going on. The instrument's being played all at the same time. No, I like it. Memo mm. to Peter Jackson. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the things we said today hosts like split screen or two of them like split screen oh i like it you know sometimes i just wish it was just one shot all the time but overall i thought a great job was done on this and i'm going to be watching it more often so good job overall to michael epstein in putting this together and especially all the participants and all the people who are interviewed you know what i thought was was um was uh, i found uh, kind of funny was early in the show when they interviewed Jim Keltner, the discussion about getting Eric Clapton to come in and play on the sessions, the Imagine sessions. So, uh, so Phil Spector rang up Eric Clapton, said Jim Keltner. Mm. And I was sleeping in the room next door and I'm thinking, wait a minute, Jim Keltner and Eric Clapton live together? I mean, these are the only, all these things only happen like, uh, uh, it seems like, like in stories. But, oh, uh, go wake up Eric. I'm not going to wake him up. Uh, <laughs> But I'll come down and play drums. It's like you go call up Eric Clapton, you get Jim Keltner. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, this is crazy. That was that was something that made me chuckle out loud. Mm. <laughs> okay, so back to you, Alan, and our main topic. Okay, so we're um, marking the 50th anniversaries of John and Yoko and Paul and Linda, and you know, I think. It, it obviously i mean you just state the obvious these were two very strong women who had a really important effect on both of those guys and um, there's there's i don't think there's anybody who would uh would say otherwise people may have different ideas about whether their effects were positive or negative but it, you know it doesn't even matter their effects were what they were i mean that's what the history is so I thought maybe we should we we'll, we'll take them separately and um I guess Yoko was on the scene first. Uh so let's uh, maybe talk about um what Yoko's effect and influence on John was, what what she brought to the mix, uh how it sort of worked out uh and and, and how we look at it today and let's start with Ken. Well, I think that Yoko was, without a doubt, the biggest influence ever on John's life. And I think that she opened up John's mind to this world of the avant-garde and the idea that anything can be considered art. And um, I think that John found that to be extremely liberating. And it came along at a time as John was getting tired of being in the Beatles. I mean, even John admitted in an interview that around the time when he was making How I Won the War, that he was starting to think about what would life be without the Beatles. But um, I think towards the end of when the group was together, John felt um, stifled creatively by being in a band. And the formula of what goes into being in a band, albeit the greatest band of all time, and a group that had more creative freedom than probably any band would and rightfully so, being the biggest band in the world. But even for someone like John, I think he was a very restless person, and I think he's the type of person that kind of would get bored very easily. And he was always looking for the next new thing, but he saw something completely different in Yoko, that there was this whole other world out there where he could do whatever he wanted to do. And if you wanted to put two minutes of silence on an album, you can do it. Mm -hmm. It didn't have to be a two, three-minute pop song. If he wanted to work on Revolution Number no. 9 with, on a Beatles album, he did it. And I don't even know if that would have happened if Yoko hadn't come along. You know, I think Yoko exposed him to this whole other world and a whole other way of thinking, which I think, um, I think John f was fascinated by. He was fascinated by what he could learn from Yoko, and he was also fascinated at the things he didn't understand about Yoko. Mm -hmm. you know, he didn't understand all of her artwork. But he was so completely supportive of her and believed in her. And this was, you know, the thing that made the most sense. It was like life didn't even begin until Yoko came along. And he said that. This was complete liberation for John. In addition to having, you know, a romantic life with Yoko as well, creatively, this was complete freedom. And um, 
you know, he wanted to collaborate with Yoko with her music as well as with her art. And, um, you know, he was completely consumed with her, especially in the very beginning. And uh, as we all know, that caused problems within the group. And um, he also later became a, a devoted father to Sean, as well as being devoted husband to Yoko. So I just think that Yoko will always be the most important person in John's life ever, not to take away anything away from the other Beatles. But I also think, and it's been said sometimes that Yoko was like a combination of Julia and Mimi, hmm. in the sense that uh, Julia allowed John to be very creative and let him do what he wanted to do artistically. And Mimi was very strict. She was the disciplinarian. And Yoko had both those qualities in her. And I think um, sometimes it's very tough to get into this psychological study <laughs> yeah. of the Beatles. But uh, sometimes you might feel like you're you're overstepping or crossing the line. But I think there may be some truth in that. Okay. John was someone who I think wanted to be around a woman who could dominate him. And he felt security in that as well. That doesn't take away anything from him as being the brilliant man that he was. But I think Yoko filled that role. Yeah, it's interesting that he would refer to her as mother. And, uh, you know, there, there, there was that aspect that you're, that you're referring to, I think. Darren? And, and also his aunt, uh, Mimi, was, I think, a controlling person. And I think that that was, whether may, he may not have, you know, when he was younger, appreciated that. But that was an aspect of uh, his youth that he missed was having that strong female at his side. And Yoko provided that. Yoko kind of provided, I guess you could say, a little bit of his mom and his aunt. You know, her mom's his mom's creative side and free wheel inside and the disciplinarian that his aunt was, Aunt Mimi. So that's uh, another thing. Uh, you pointed out, uh, Ken, uh, when you mentioned that John was thinking as far back as the filming of How I Won the War in, I guess that would be the uh, fall of 1966, that he was beginning to realize that being a Beatle was not a be-all, end-all, and was not totally what it was cracked up to be, and the thoughts of possibly not being a Beatle going off on his own. He was disillusioned. That was maybe the first time the disillusionment in being a member of the Fab Four kind of really started to uh, linger in his mind. Klaus Vorman alluded to that in the, we were just talking about John and Yoko above us only sky, the documentary. There is a scene where Klaus said, and correct me if I'm getting, I, I'm almost positive it was Klaus who visited the Beatles during the filming of the Strawberry Appeals forever promotional film and said that John was very sad mm. and very he was very sad and was not in a good place because he was tired and, I guess, bored. And within a year and change, give or take, Yoko crept into his life at maybe just about the right time. So it was Klaus Vorman, correct, that uh, mentioned that in the film? I think so. Yeah, he visited with the Beatles when, and, and they were showing clips of the filming of Strawberry Fields Forever. And saying that Klaus could see a sadness that he had he he was not familiar with in John. You know, it was beginning to take its toll. It was beginning to be, you know, a case of, is that all there is, you know, to being part of the biggest band in the land? And then along comes Yoko, who, like you said, Ken, she was like a light bulb that went off in his head. Mm -hmm. you know? He didn't just have to be a Beatle. He didn't just have to be a musician. Remember when he was younger, he drew, he wrote, he played guitar in a skipple group because everyone played guitar in a skipple group. But what if the choir men didn't catch on? Would John have ended up being a poet? We don't know. All of this kind of came back to the forefront once John met Yoko because he saw that the possibilities were limitless uh, and art could be anything. Mm -hmm. And he could make a rock record. And then he could make a recording of uh, a radio being tuned in for 12 minutes. Right. And that would be art. And they would both be valid. And he's right. They are. You might not like listening to. And that tuning of the radio is on Life with the Lions radio play. 
but it's as much as art as as uh, a Pablo Picasso painting. And uh, you know, it was just like once he, it was it was like he got punched in the face when he met Yoko. This big awakening, and uh, you know, people say, "Oh, Yoko broke up the Beatles," which really twists me up when I hear that. Yoko, I think, made. I don't want to say made John Lennon what he was because John Lennon was already, he was already an icon, but she opened up facets that completed the picture, facets of his uh, talents and his personality that completed the picture that made John Lennon the whole that we know today. Mm -hmm. well, that makes sense. What about, however, I mean, just to play devil's advocate here a little, um, what about the fact that, you know, even before John got involved with Yoko, Paul was into more avant-garde stuff. They did Carnival of Light. They, you know, did other stuff. Paul was uh, in, in 66 when John was filming and George was in India. Paul was going to avant-garde concerts and plays and other things and almost you know, undoubtedly he was telling John about the stuff he was finding and discovering and playing him bits of things. And he was bringing in tape loops for revolver. And, uh, why do you think that it wasn't until Yoko came along that John sort of hopped onto the avant-garde stuff? Couldn't it have been that already from that point in, so let's say 1966, that John was beginning to feel um, stifled by Paul. Was Paul was beginning to suffocate what was once his band, John's band, the Quarrymen, just 10 years earlier, nine years earlier. Now Paul, hey, John, hey, John, hey, John. And it, there was a little bit, maybe John had a little bit of a, oh, what, Paul, what now? Hmm. You know, and then he needed somebody else with a clean slate to come into the picture. Hmm. And maybe present the same things, but now they sounded different, looked different, smelled different. Now that Yoko was, uh, you know, bringing these original ideas, these unique ideas into the picture, he's accepting it th them being delivered to him by Yoko more so than than Paul, because Paul was just like, you know, the brother he's been living with every day, and it's like, yeah, 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 whatever, you know. I, mean, I don't need you to show me how to make tape loops. I know how to make them. Hmm. Mm. Well, possibly. I'm not sure. I'm not sure their their relationship had quite that dynamic at that time. I think they were still on really good terms. It's just... Um... I think you couldn't have a situation that would be on really good terms with someone, yet at the same time feel like, <sighs> yeah. there he goes again. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> sure, yeah. You know, and 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 that's not going to come. He's John's not going to talk about that out loud. It wasn't an issue at the time, right? You know, the the issues, the personality clashes would come in a year or so. But at that point, there was still maybe John didn't know, exactly know that he was mentally, you know, internally responding to Paul's enthusiasm and his uh, excitement over this and that and the other thing. Mm -hmm. Yoko was different. Yoko well, again, from a totally different place. Yeah. Yeah, Yoko came at it, I think, from a different way, too. I mean, with Paul, John, you know, they knew each other. They grew up together. They kind of had the same sort of background. Yoko came sort of out of left field for John, you know. I mean, she had grown up in Japan and in New York and was part of, you know, the whole avant-garde thing was what she had been doing as opposed to something Paul was discovering and passing on to John with, with Yoko right. there. I think there might've been more of a, let's say authenticity because this was what her life was, you know, I mean, she was doing cut piece and uh, you know, her musical things and her loft concerts in New York long before she ever went to England. And uh, you know, and I think there were people who were very suspicious of that, but I mean, I've been digging in the New York Times archives and, you know, there's, there were reviews of her things. They're not always um, especially positive, but she also started that whole loft concert scene that's still going on in New York New Music Circles. You know, she had a loft 
put on concerts uh, where people like Lamont Young and uh, Philip Corner, I mean, a lot of composers who were an important part of the New York new music scene, uh, you know, she, she was there back then putting these things on. So I, I think she comes to it with legitimacy that a lot of people who don't look at that world uh, aren't really aware of and, um, and, and don't want to give her credit for. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. She was recognized in those field in that field. And, um, it's, it's kind of interesting you bring this up because, um, <laughs> One of the few, if any, Beatle questions I would ever want to ask Paul McCartney, given the chance, is why he and John didn't connect more with Avant-Garde and work on that together. I mean, Paul wasn't involved with Revolution Number no. 9. Right. That was John and Yoko and a little bit of George Harrison right. in there. But um, I do kind of think that, and John did say around the time of Magical Mystery Tour, that he would come in with two songs, and then Paul would come in with nine. <laughs> it would seem like that to him. It's probably an exaggeration, but... Um, and even George Harrison said the same thing, mm-hmm. that when, when he came to the table with you know a few of his new songs, Paul had a wealth of material that he wanted the band to work on. And so I do believe that in, in the very beginning of the Beatles, even though John was very proud to say that he brought Paul in to make it a stronger band, I think deep down he thought he was the leader of the group and he was recognized as such. And I think as time went on, as Paul started to be to become better and better as a songwriter, John was a little threatened by that. And then towards the end of the Beatles, you know, when, when John and Paul were either writing an equal amount together or Paul was getting more of the hits, I think John was threatened by that. I think Paul... The two of them, this should be a John and Paul show. <laughs> the, the two of them, I think, are very different in, in, the, in the sense that I think that John felt threatened by Paul, but I think that Paul thrived on the competitiveness. So uh, That's just my own personal opinion. But, uh, but getting back to this, I, I think that the reason why they didn't work together with the avant-garde stuff was probably because he, uh, he was looking for someone else to work with so maybe Paul wouldn't get, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say the credit, but he wanted to start going in a different direction. And I also think that George Harrison started to get better and better as a songwriter. Mm-hmm. I think John was kind of threatened by that to the point where, you know, he may not have been number one in the group. So I think there was some competitiveness in the in the group. I don't think anyone would ever deny that. But I think that's part of the reason why Paul and John didn't work together more in that field. And and also, there's the romantic angle with Yoko. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have to look at it that way as well. But if John was starting to look at another career for himself beyond the Beatles, he saw that in Yoko and then went full throttle with it. So um, that's kind of how I feel. Yeah, because it was more exciting to John. What Yoko was bringing to the table and the ideas that she had and you know, that was more exciting to John. It was fresh. It was new. Uh, the Beatle thing was old. It was, you know, it was, uh, you know, like you said, I wrote, he had a couple of really great songs. Here comes Paul with an album's worth of songs. Uh, you know what? I don't need this. I can write my songs. I can do my art. And it's a lot more exciting. And, you know, it's like a new having a new toy. And I'd rather be doing this than, than you know. And Yoko, you know, being the... The uh, free spirit, you know, was f- overflowing with ideas, with uh, giving John the confidence and the motivation to go ahead and run with this idea that you have. It's not weird. You know, you want weird? Look what I did three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you mm. know, and uh, again, like I said at the beginning, also, I think I think her quiet. I mean, you don't really see it in f- clips and interview segments. She seems quiet. And even occasionally, even a little timid. I think there was a strength there that had been lacking in John's life, going back to when he was a childhood, of his strong female presence. That also, this whole, you know, this this other element that made Yoko what she was in John's life. And uh, in an unrelated way, or a different way, it was the same thing with what Linda brought to Paul's life. 
It's kind of strange that we're saying this because you just said, Darren, that what Paul was bringing was more of the old in. I don't know how you could even think that when if you're talking about 1966 and 67, they're doing Revolver and Sgt. Pepper and putting tape loops at the end of Tomorrow Never Knows should have been something exciting. Yeah, so but, but it's it's all coming from the same. I'm, I'm a guitarist, songwriter in a rock band, and that's it. Yeah, we're expanding what a rock band is capable of coming doing. And I don't know when they were actually doing these things at the time, if they were thinking to themselves, ah, we're breaking ground. You know, I don't yeah. think it was. It was just a natural for them progression artistically as musicians in a pop band. And for John, any innovations or exciting things that he were coming up with were all rooted in this one thing. Yoko opened up four, five, six, seven different avenues. Mm hmm. You know what I mean? And it made them all, it made the whole thing different for him. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I know what you mean. I, you know, with the stuff they did with the Beatles in a normal Beatles context was still, you know, four-minute songs, three-minute songs, um, in a rock context, structured like rock things, even if the sounds were different. What Yoko... I think represented to John at the time they got together and he began bringing her to sessions and especially around the time of let it be was the possibility of just sort of kicking the whole thing over and doing something completely out there and unpredictable and new and weird. You know, there's that film um wonder what Peter Jackson will do uh, with of the day that George quit. Uh, right. And then the rest of them just sort of got into this really sort of aggressive jam with Yoko doing her vocalizing. Um, and I think that in a certain way, John would have kind of liked it if the Beatles did that. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that he was pushing it as like, this is what we got to do from now on. But he occasionally would say something like, you know, Yoko should have a say, you know. And, uh, you know, who knows if they had if they had put that out, uh, it, who, who knows, uh, you know, what people would have made of it probably would have hated it. But um, but it would have been something different. It would have been something much more different than anything that they had done, except for Revolution 9, maybe. And, you know, one other thing, even though Paul was into the avant garde stuff, he was also very self-conscious mm -hmm. about the Beatles image. And um, yeah. I, I couldn't have seen the Beatles do what John and Yoko were doing and put that on a Beatles record. Right. And John wanted to uh, stir up the Beatles image. He <laughs> didn't never thought of it as uh, as being something so precious that it couldn't be, you know, broken down and built back up again. Right. Good point, though. But, but Paul did treasure what the Beatles were. Mm. I mean, the cover of the Two Virgins album is a good idea of what John was thinking. I don't care that it's going to ruin the Beatle image that I take a picture of my girlfriend at the time they weren't married naked and put it on an album cover. I don't care if it ruins the image. The others were like, John, the image. Come on. Screw the image. I want to do more of this type of stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yoko opened this. This unlocked this in John's head. Right. Yeah. Shall, yeah. shall we turn our attention to Linda? Okay. <laughs> um, so Linda turns up at a time when, you know, the White Album is still being recorded. Paul's romantic life is actually kind of a circus. I mean, it's still on with Jane, but not really in a way. I mean, they had announced the previous Christmas that they were engaged, but they were still apart an awful lot of the time. And Paul was spending a lot of time with other women besides Jane. I mean, Francie Schwartz, for one. There was a, another woman in London, uh, Maggie something. Uh, he was photographed with her out sometimes. And uh, yeah, you know, and then, but then he met Linda sort of along the way here uh, in... I guess, New York, uh, when he was over to do the Apple announcement with John. And then when he went a month later to sort of announce Apple to the Capitol sort of big annual meeting, um, went to L.A. And 
Linda flew out there and they spent some time together out there. Then a few months later, he invites her to London to basically come and stay. I'm not sure he invited her to come and stay, but once she was there, that was sort of the way it went. Um, I think I think initially it was just a visit. And then the Beatles, you know, to, to fast forward a bit, the Beatles implode and Linda is basically stuck with this mess that is Paul, post Beatle, trying to figure out what he's going to do with himself. And Paul has given her an immense amount of credit for sort of pulling him out of that and pulling him out of it gradually, you know, not just saying, okay, knock it off, you know, listening, someone there to listen. And, um, you know, and Linda knew that world. I mean, Yoko came from the avant-garde world. Linda came from basically the rock world. She knew a lot of the British groups. She knew a lot of the American groups. She had been taking photographs and, you know, and, and, and she sort of knew this world. And then they sort of went off to Scotland and, and she had to do this sort of rescue and reconstruction job. Mm. So, Ken, observations? I, I like that phrase there. <laughs> rescue rescue and restoration was it reconstruction <laughs> Res, rescue and reconstruction job i like that that's very good is that um, the name of an appliance store sorry never mind <laughs> <laughs> no i give linda a lot of credit because uh like you just said uh alan she had to lift paul out of the doldrums there and um the way the whole beetle thing ended it, it was ugly for him Mm-hmm. Not just because of the fact that they weren't working together, but in the end, he had to sue his his three best friends right there, mm-hmm. which is something he never envisioned. And then you've got the whole mess of uh, John wanting his his in laws to represent the Beatles Paul. In, Paul. in managing in managing them versus Alan Klein and the whole war that happened there between the other three and Paul. And so um, I give Linda a lot of credit for. You know, after that whole thing happened, and actually while it was happening, to to get him to, you know, pick himself up and start doing work again, because mm-hmm. that's what he does. And um, you know, she she made so many contributions to Paul and to the world. Uh, I, Paul loved her photography. I thought she was a fantastic photographer. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, taking a lot of photos of rock stars in the very beginning, working for Rolling Stone, you know, and doing a lot of fantastic photos. She did love early rock and roll, just like Paul did. And when it came time to forming a band like Wings, Paul asked her to join. And she actually added quite a lot to the group in terms of the harmony work in particular. And I think it's such an important part of the whole McCartney sound in his solo career, Linder's background vocals. But I think um, one of the most important things was that um, Paul and Linda were both devoted to having a strong family life. And, um, you know, I think Linda only reinforced that in Paul because Paul always cared about his family. He was a big family man from the very beginning. And to this day, you know, while he was married to Linda and after her passing, he's been the most devoted father to his kids, supporting everything that they do. And, um, you know, being close with his family. I know for a fact that he's close with a lot of his relatives. He's very much into the family life to the point where when he asked Linda to join Wings, part of the reason was because he knew he was going to be on the road, wanted to have her with him, as well as take the kids. Mm -hmm. So that's how much of a family man Paul was. He didn't just want to be out on his own all the time. And also they had that shared love of animals. Mm -hmm. They both became vegetarians together. They both worked a lot for animal rights. And, um, of course, Linda, you got to give her a lot of credit for starting her vegetarian uh, line of frozen foods. She might have been, she was definitely one of the first to do it. I don't know if she was the first. And with the exception of when Paul was in jail in Tokyo, they were never apart for the 29 years they were together. They were, without question, the most, one of the most successful marriages ever in the entertainment field. And I really do admire the fact that, you know, Paul was so supportive of anything that she did to the point where, you know, Linda would go on a tour and um, promote a photography book of her work or her vegetarian meals. And Paul would stay on the sidelines Mm -hmm. and not interfere. 
even though I'm sure a lot of people would be asking Linda questions about Paul or wanting to, he recognized the fact that, you know, she had a life of her own doing these different things, the vegetarian meals and, and um, the photography. So I admire the hell out of Paul for, you know, letting her have her space in addition to Linda helping Paul out with the music. So that's what I think about when it comes to Linda. Interesting when it comes to both John and Paul, they both married strong women. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to have women that were just subservient to them. Right. You know, they all had minds of their own. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, what was it Paul said about Linda that she wasn't thick? <laughs> you know, that, um, you know, she, she has her own career independent of what what Paul was doing, although it helped to be a McCartney, you know, to get her work out there. But she stood out on her own, and I, I really admired her a lot for that, and Paul for supporting her. But um, that's kind of how I feel. So, Darren? What's interesting is that John and Paul, the center of uh, the greatest uh, musical entity uh, of, of our time, close friends from when they were teenagers, when they met, would go uh, through paths that were sort of similar when it came to their personal lives, especially with their, uh, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, their primary wives, if you know what I mean. Uh, not to not to discredit Cynthia or Paul's other wives after Linda's passing, but here John meets Yoko, and, and in a very, very short time later, Linda comes into the picture with Paul. And you have John bringing Yoko into the studios, into Beatles sessions. Don't forget that uh, Linda was photographed at the same time. Paul was bringing his girlfriends in in 68. Maybe not as often as Yoko was around. Mm -hmm. Uh, Definitely not as often as Yoko was around. Here you have two women who were both married once. Both had uh, already had a child from the previous marriages. And were both strong women who were both pivotal to the mental well-being of uh, of John and Paul. Interesting comparisons that that those two things would line up. And as as you as you've mentioned, the case of Linda, she was needed more behind the scenes and needed more in terms of uh, uh, Paul's uh, mental well-being. Whereas John Yoko was able to spur John's outward life. Pardon, you know, mm-hmm. that's, you know, you know, what I'm saying where, where it was more of an internal, closed, quiet, behind closed doors thing with Linda, who was building up the mental psyche of Paul had to, re- like you said, had to uh, kind of repair and reconstruct Paul. Yoko was taking this person who was eager uh, and showing him the way artistically and outwardly and publicly. Uh, so those were the opposites, but both played similar roles. Where would Paul and John, what route would they have taken had they never met Yoko and Linda? Mm-hmm. How would I... the Beatles have ended? Would they have ended? Would Paul have gone into a period of uh, seclusion of for years? Would he have come out of it? Would the Beatles have broken up? You know, you never, we'll never know this, but they, these two women helped steer the course that they would go on yeah i mean you you could probably say that if linda wasn't in paul's life he might very well have just signed on with alan klein with the others you know i mean because he he wouldn't have had an option he wouldn't have had a built-in in-law hey look what i i have a manager right here right and 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 i think um they were also able to put him in the picture more about alan klein than he would have found out on his own as well um although nat weiss um who was the beatles lawyer in new york a close friend of brian epstein was not a big fan of alan klein either um he possibly could have weighed in on that but I, i'm not sure they ever really asked him i think there's another couple of things to say about um both of these women had a really hard time in a number of ways for one thing um and they had to have both kind of known at least in the abstract that they were signing on for this with these two guys but you know they were both extremely vilified at the time by especially women fans 
Um, there Ooh. is, we, we hear a lot about Yoko because people still, you know, say things about her, but, um, and, and I think that there's also the, the racial dynamic there in Yoko's case, but in Linda too, you know, there's a lot of, um, I've seen a lot of outtake news footage from the day they got married and the stuff those girls outside the registry office were saying about her is, is just like outrageous, you know, and that went on. Well, uh, it- it goes beyond that, no way, because even to this day, there are people that don't see what John saw in Yoko. Right. And don't see her talent or see her as a talent. And they don't understand avant garde. Mm-hmm. And they have one image of her. Mm-hmm. And they don't know the full extent of her work, nor do they care to want to learn it. So there's, there are fans who are like that to this day, 50 years later. Right. And the other thing is that. Both of their guys were a handful. (laughs) I mean, you know, with Paul, we already talked about the sort of funk that he was in, you know, post-Beatles. But in all the years after as well, I mean, you talk to enough people who work at MPL, there was this feeling that, you know, everybody loved Linda and a lot of people had a hard time with Paul. I mean, Paul as we know, um, likes to have his way, likes to have it done the way he wants it done. And that can be very difficult for people who are around him. And that would probably include Linda, but she, she seems to have found a way to make it work and sort of come out of it, you know, whole in a way. Um, and with Yoko and John, I mean, Yoko has talked about the, um, significant number of affairs John had when they were together. I mean, not even counting, you know, the year and a half that um, he was off with May, which Yoko sort of engineered in a, you know, strange story. But, um, you know, but when they were together, he would just sort of go off and do whatever he wanted. And that was, um, you know, she still talks about that. So it obviously was not something that she just said, oh, yeah, well, who cares, you know? So, so both of them really had a, a, a difficult job, and I think that they, you know, they obviously were the right people uh, to be able to manage all of these aspects, including the fan vilification and and the interpersonal stuff with these two, you know, relatively difficult men. And they both, in a way, both women gave their men confidence mm-hmm. in themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, because Yoko made John realize that he is a talent unto himself with or without the Beatles. Right. She wasn't there to break up the Beatles, but she made John aware that he's a talent by himself. You know, he didn't have to rely on the others to come up with great music, and he proved that. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, Linda was there, like we said, while the Beatles were breaking up and after to, to push Paul and make him feel like, come on, you got to do something. This is what your talent is. And she helped to get him out there mm-hmm. in the public eye and make music and tour. So we owe a lot to both those women. Yeah. Oh, and Linda also had to put up with the you know criticism of her musicianship when she actually, what she has said is that she didn't really want to be in the band in the first place. She agreed to do it because Paul asked her to do it. And there were some benefits, like as, as you guys have said, touring with the kids and having everybody always there. But, you know, we've all talked to Denny Sywell and Lawrence Juber and various people who've um, who've been on Things We Said Today and and Ken on your show uh, who were in Wings and worked with Linda. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, as musicians, as professional musicians, they kind of concede that Linda was not the greatest keyboard player going and all of that. And yet... All of them are actually very protective of her, you know? I think they understand that she didn't push herself into that band. She was there because Paul wanted her to be there, and she just did the best that she could and got better, you know, over the years. But even as late as, like, 1989-90, you know, that the tape turned up with just her vocals. I mean, that was mm-hmm. that had to have been painful for her and for Paul, you know, but... You know, you can get isolations of an awful lot of people <laughs> out uh-huh. on on the rock circuit and play them, and and you would get stuff like that. You know, so yeah, it it, it did seem a little unfair. But but her background harmonies added so much mm-hmm. to to fill out the sound of a lot of those key records. 
like silly love songs or with a little luck or listen to what the man said certain songs mm-hmm. you know uh, she was a, a big part of that overall sound Mm-hmm. And uh, no one will say that she was a great keyboard player, but she was adequate, and you know she learned her parts. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think most people who are in Wings, like the people we've interviewed, will say that she was there to have fun, and she made it a fun job for people. And I also think, in some ways, that many of the people who are in Wings feel close to Paul and Linda because it was also a family. They hung out with the family. They were with them a lot. So it wasn't just a job working for the leader of the group, you know? There was Mm -hmm. more to it. They had more of a relationship that way, Mm -hmm. especially in the early days of Wings, because they spent a lot of time on the farm together. Right. So it was almost like they were a family. But, yeah, I think Linda deserves a lot of credit for for contributing a lot to Paul's records that way. I'm I'm glad you mentioned that, Ken, because I've been saying that for eons that one of the things linda may have been limited musically and she was limited vocally as well but uh there was a quality to her voice especially when mixed with denny lane that gave wings a signature sound Mm. Uh, and the great bands have signature sounds you could spot them from a mile away and uh there was nothing like those linda denny lane harmonies you don't realize that you know the uniqueness of them didn't reinvent the wheel just really worked well together sounded great together so if there was um you know if nothing else linda made a subtle yet very important contribution to what wings were you know her voice was was there a lot on those wings records a lot less so after wings but it, I remember that right after her passing, the records that Paul was putting out, while I enjoyed them, it just seemed like it was missing something without Linda. Hmm. Yeah, you're right. I agree. You know, so, yeah, it, it just it, it hit me very quickly right after her passing. So it just kind of tells you that whether you realize it or not, she made a contribution you're right. to the music. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so this was um, just sort of a, a look back on the uh, in the anniversary, 50th anniversary month of uh, both John and Yoko's marriage and Paul and Linda's marriage, and uh, there's obviously always plenty more to be said, um, and maybe someday we'll return to it. And uh, in the meantime, uh, why don't we just sort of go around and give our contact information? Uh, start with Darren. All right. Well, uh, for me, I'm at WFUV in New York City, and my email address there, should you want to send me a note, is Darren DeVivo, D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O at WFUV.org, or you can go to Facebook. And I've got two Facebook pages, a personal one and a broadcasting one. I'd prefer for you, if you could, go to Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. That's the name of the page. Like me there, and we're all set. We'll be in touch. The Fest for Beatles fans is coming up the last weekend in March for lack of a calendar. What are the dates? 20, <laughs> 29th, 30th, and 31st. That's easy for you to say. So, Beatles Fest, uh, the Fest for Beatles fans uh, is happening in Jersey City on the dates that Ken told you. And uh, I will be there as always. Ken will be there as always. Uh, I will be there for the full weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Ken will be there on Saturday and most likely Sunday. And uh, we are going to take things we said today, two-thirds of it, to the uh, to a panel. There will be a panel that Ken and I will be on. Topic? We think we know what we're going to talk about, but it's a surprise. You have to show up. And Although the schedule has not been officially announced yet at the time of this recording, I am under the impression that Ken and I are going to be doing our panel on Saturday, day two. And I also believe I'm going to be on at least two other panels, one on Saturday and I believe one on Sunday. So uh, if uh, you come to the Fest for Beatles fans, uh, look for Ken and I. Please come by and say hello. And... um, uh, vegetables, especially tomatoes, will be checked at the door for the uh, for the panel that Ken and I are doing 
Uh, we do not want any tomatoes thrown our way. Uh, so we'll see you at the fest. But we will take jelly babies. <laughs> <laughs> Those will take an eye out, though. <laughs> and you know what they also, say, it's always fun until an eye comes out. I should mention that I'll be on a panel as well with my other podcast for Talk More Talk, the Solo Beatles Do you know video what podcast. I'm not sure yet. I believe it's it's going to be Sunday, but I'm not certain. We I haven't been told yet. One thing has come up with the fest is that they have just added the zombies yeah. uh, as guests. And I think if memory serves correct, at approximately a quarter to six Saturday afternoon, the zombies will be doing an interview session. That will be their only uh, thing they're doing at the fest. But uh, so any Saturday activities, whether they involve me or Ken or even don't involve us, probably will be centered into like the daylight and then the evening. And that John was- Montagna, too, will also be on Saturday when we did our our show with him. He told us his um, presentation on Paul as a bass player during the Abbey Road album will be on Saturday. By the way, thanks to everybody that wrote in about that show complimenting us. We got more people writing in about that show than, boy, it's, it's I, I can't remember. You know, a lot of people re- were really pleased with the show with John, and uh, hopefully we'll have him on uh, again soon. Uh, on to Ken. Uh, you can reach me by email at everylittlething at att.net. And also I have my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. I want to mention two quick things because since our last show, I did two uh, really good interviews that are now on my website. One I mentioned before is with Michael Epstein. He's the director of the new documentary on John and Yoko, Above Us Only Sky. And a few days ago, I had the pleasure of talking to someone named Mark Mann. Mark Mann is a guitar player who uh, played on George Harrison's Brainwashed album. He also did the string arrangements for Marwa Blues, as well as Rising Sun on Brainwashed. But you might know him better because he played at the concert for George. He was on stage with all those great, talented people, and he played the guitar behind Paul McCartney, when Paul was doing something, and he's the guy who did George Harrison's guitar solo and nailed it, note for note. He actually started his relationship with the Beatles through Jeff Lynn. He was there during the Traveling Wilbury sessions, although he didn't play on them. But um, what you might find very interesting, and we talk about this at length in our interview, is that um, Jeff gave him the assignment of taking John Lennon's cassette which had Free as a Bird and Real Love, and cleaning it up before they used it to make the recordings with the Beatles. Mm -hmm. So that was Mark's job to do that. In addition to that, he worked on ELO's album Zoom, playing on it, and Ringo is on two tracks on Zoom, and George is on two tracks on Zoom. They're not together, but uh, Mark witnessed sessions with Ringo and George for that album. We talk about that. And he's also got a new album coming out with uh, a band called Lefty and the Hat Man. The reason why it's called that is because Mark is known for wearing hats. He's the guy that wears a cap, you know, throughout the concert for George. That's how you'll recognize him. By the way, I didn't talk about this with him. It's the only thing I forgot to bring up. But when George Harrison was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and they did that performance of While My Guitar Gently Weeps with Danny Harrison and Tom Petty, Jeff Lynne, Mark Mann was in that band. And he played along with everybody else. That's the performance that where Prince stole the show. Mm-hmm. But um, Mark Mann is in that band as well. So we talk about all these things. And there's a lot that you'll learn about, about all the things I mentioned, especially the concert for George. And uh, that's on my website on interviews, page four. The two interviews, Mark Mann and Michael Epstein, you can find on the same page. Interviews page four at KenMichaelsRadio.com. So I'm really excited about those two interviews. I hope you guys can check it out. Okay. And I'm Alan Cozen. You can reach me and on Facebook uh, is probably the easiest way. And I have two Facebook pages. Um, one is just Alan Cozen. Uh, the other is Alan Cozen Remixed. And um, either one, 
I'm there. Uh, you can also reach all of us at uh, our email address, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter account you can follow us on. That's at things we said fab. And we have a Facebook page for the show, which is things we said today, Beatles radio fans at Facebook. So there we are. And um, so this was a fun talk. And so for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen saying thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Music